Welcome back to the podcast. In our last couple episodes, we followed the tale of Maine. Not the Maine that was created in 1820, but the Maine that existed in the 17th century. In 1622, Maine was this huge swath of land in northern New England. It was split and turned into two sister colonies, one you've heard of, New Hampshire and New Somersetshire. When New Somersetshire received its 1639 charter, the king insisted that it become once again Maine. And as I alluded to several times, some of the migration of English people did not come from overseas, but actually from the south, from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, overland to New Hampshire and to Maine in order to escape some combination of religious or political persecution. Now, I thought it was only fair that I focused on one of these individuals, perhaps the most famous, to head north from Massachusetts instead of south to what would eventually become Rhode Island. And that's why this episode is about Reverend John Wheelwright. The Reverend was born in 1592 in England to a well-to-do yeoman family, part of this growing middle class that England has and isn't quite sure what to do with yet. He graduated from Cambridge University in 1614 and then again with an advanced degree in 1618. In college, he made an important friend with a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell, who, if you know anything about English history, there is a period of time after the execution of Charles I and the restoration under Charles II when Parliament eventually yielded power and what was created was called a protectorate of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And the protector of the protectorate was Oliver Cromwell, who was king in all but name. And so a very important friend to meet in college, I would say. Of course, this is decades before the English Civil War. Cotton Mather records that Oliver Cromwell said of Wheelwright, he had been more afraid of meeting Wheelwright at football than of meeting any army since in the field. Indeed, the Reverend is described as being quite broad and tall with prominent features, curly hair and an abundance of facial hair. Important here is he was not a man to be easily intimidated. In school, he began to fall into the Puritan fold, the Puritan wing of the larger Anglican church. Now, up until this point, I've only really hinted about the nature of Puritanism because we haven't focused on it. We focused on everyone in New England other than the Puritans because all of that is very well covered in history textbooks. But over the next few episodes, I will be doling out information on the Puritans without sounding like a college lecture being too far off topic and too abstract to really feed into our main story. What you need to know right now about Wheelwright is he fell into the strain of Puritanism advocated by Reverend John Cotton, whom was a teacher to Wheelwright, a mentor and a friend. Now, the wider Anglican church was very vague in the time of James I and Elizabeth and encompassed a variety of different Christian values and beliefs. You could have people who were basically Catholic in their upbringing and, and their expectations as far as service is concerned, and their needs would be met. You could have those who were strictly Calvinists, and in the time of Elizabeth and James I, their needs would be met. Perhaps not during the same sermon or in the same location, but it was a wide tent. But that tent started to break apart toward the tail end of Queen Elizabeth's life. And in fact, soon after the ascension of James I, a group of prominent Puritans called the king to what has become known as the Hampton Court Conference, where the Puritans had a number of different demands, or you could say requests, of the king and how the Anglican Church should be run. One of their big sticking points is they wanted to get rid of the bishops. The Anglican Church was actually a wing of the government, essentially, at the time. And the bishops were the link between the king and the people, and also many of them served in different political positions by appointment of the king. The Puritans ideally wanted to organize their own congregations and then have those congregations come into communion with one another, much as they theorized the ancient church worked shortly after the time of Christ. But I know it's hard to think about this now, but then that seemed like a move towards a democracy or a move towards even anarchy, especially to a king. Here's this group of people who seemingly want to get rid of the connection between him, supposedly the head of the Anglican Church, and its various adherents, and then allow them to organize themselves on matters of religion? This was a move towards what you could call a spiritual democracy that was far too advanced for the early 17th century, especially a monarch in the early 17th century who's supposed to be the head of this church. After this conference, James I said, 
I shall make them conform themselves or I will harry them out of the land. And from that date in 1604, the schism just grew. Now back to John Cotton, Will Wright's mentor, his variety of Puritanism probably went as far to the edge as you could get and still be called Puritanism. And this is the last little bit of my lecture, I promise. The Puritans were a Calvinist religion, which at the time meant that they believed in predestination. In other words, God is a perfect being who designed the universe and everything that was going to happen in it before time itself existed. And he is the, the clock-making God. And once he started the universe, everything was going to happen as designed. Like the Greeks, it was fatalistic. What has been designed is what's going to happen. It is anti-free will. And if you believe that God is perfect and is the designer, it does tend to diminish your ability to fit free will into your understanding of reality. And so the Puritans, in its simplest way of putting it, they believe that you were either elect, chosen for salvation, or you were chosen for damnation. And that choice was made before you ever even existed. Just the idea of you before the material reality was already sectioned off to go one way or the other. Given that, the Reverend John Cotton argued and preached that as Puritans, we believe your fate is already sealed. You can only be saved by the grace of God, and no amount of good works that you do on this earth can change what has already been predestined for you. You are a passive being to fate. Wheelwright also adopted this view. In 1619, he became the vicar of Billsby, which is in Lincolnshire, where he, like many of his Puritan friends, began stripping away all the pomp and ritual James I came to expect in his Anglican services. The use of uniform prayer books, uniform scripted services, different garb that would be worn, and ornamentations that you would find in a Catholic church. Whereas John Cotton was more subtle and more political and could disagree with you without appearing like he disagreed with you. Wheelwright, again, was stubborn and strong and not the type of man to downplay a disagreement or find a commonality, but emphasize where he differed from somebody else. This, of course, would get him in trouble. In 1632, in and around there, he was officially silenced by the Church of England and forbidden to preach in his own church, which caused him to move to private teaching. This must have been a hard time in his life. You had a, a sudden loss of income, and around this time, in a couple years before, he had lost two children, he had lost his first wife, and now he lost his way to make a living and his congregation, his community. In 1633, it was known that he tried to sell his position in Lincolnshire to a wealthy person who had been financing him for the last year or so. Now the church charged him with simony, which is exactly that, trying to sell a church position or church favor. And of course he was and found guilty. As it turns out, he wanted the money so he could start over and move to the New World, to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where many Puritans had started to go, where the Church of England existed on paper, but had no on-the-ground reality whatsoever. And so why not sell a position he wasn't able to use anyway? It's known that around this time, he married a woman by the name of Mary Hutchinson. And now why this is important is because the Hutchinson family were also followers of John Cotton. And while Wheelwright married into it, so did a woman by the name of Anne, who would become known as the very famous Anne Hutchinson. And by the year 1636, John Cotton and his followers had moved to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Wheelwright and his followers, mostly from Lincolnshire, moved to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the larger Hutchinson family, including Anne Hutchinson. Now, the controversy that follows is often shaded in specifically religious terms. But remember, at this time, we are not in a secular age. And religion and politics and all things social, it's all mixed together as one big tangled mess. And an important thing here is that with Cotton's group moving in to Massachusetts in 1636, they are part of a new wave of Puritans into the colony that are slightly different than the older wave. If for no other reason, they were not there at the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So if you remember a couple episodes ago, we talked about all the different English people who lived in the Boston area before the Massachusetts Bay Colony ever existed. Those people were a little put off by those first Puritan immigrants with the Bay Company, and most of them left. Well, now the Bay Company has had their first wave of immigration, and now the second wave is coming in. 
And the second wave will want to go to the same churches, have the same access to politics as the first. The political context here is that the first wave is now going to be scared of what the second wave will do to their power base. Will they be able to integrate successfully? Will they lead everyone away on a revolution? What's going to happen? And it's apparent as soon as Cotton and Wheelwright show up, not too long after anyway, that their Puritan beliefs are a little bit different than everybody else in the colony. Specifically on this issue I brought up before, where you were saved by grace. Cotton believed that 100%. Wheelwright, same thing. Anne Hutchinson, same thing. You are saved by grace and grace alone. Only God can save you. It's only by the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus Christ that you are given eternal life. But the Massachusetts strain on that, while they acknowledge everything that was just said, has a strong flavor of self-improvement that Cotton's group didn't have. I had a college professor, actually, in uh, grad school who argued that the prevalence of self-improvement books in the United States versus everywhere else in the world may have stemmed all the way back to the Puritan era. Because these other Puritans, they believed that some amount of good works would help you get to salvation, at least realize the salvation that was already given to you faster than if you did not do those works. Furthermore, good moral works, after you've already had your moment of salvation, your moment of realizing grace, would establish and demonstrate your salvation to the others who are of the elect, and thus give you the, the status of a visible saint. And for these Massachusetts Puritans, this would be the basis for their law and order, for living in an orderly society, for having a definable system of morality, for trying to improve yourself, your family, your community, and all of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. For them, John Cotton's free grace beliefs were ultimately the path towards anarchism, towards lax morality, towards the fracturing of harmony between the churches and communion with one another. Now, most people wouldn't even care about this kind of stuff today, and they certainly wouldn't start an argument with somebody over it. But back then, a religious issue of this nature really could cause chaos. And Cotton, Wheelwright, Hutchinson, all of their followers to the people in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Puritans who were there beforehand, it all seemed to be a little bit Anabaptist. The Anabaptists, of course, are the forerunners to the modern day Amish and Mennonites. And there was actually quite a bit of violence and chaos involved in the emergence of their religious sects on the European continent. Wheelwright specifically was invited to be a pastor in Boston, but it was John Winthrop who vetoed the hire. He ultimately became the minister for Mount Wollaston, now taken over by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Though their differences seem minor to us, in October of 1636, Cotton and Wheelwright were both called to a religious conclave to talk over their doctrinal differences with all of the other ministers in the colony. Not a short conference by any means. And eventually, Wheelwright and Cotton were found to have no errors in their ways, being as they admitted that doing works might help you find out that you are part of the elect faster than not doing works, among a couple other little concessions. Events happen quite quickly now. Shortly after John Wheelwright arrives and takes post, the Pequot War breaks out, which would be the largest war Massachusetts would ever have to fight up to this point in its short history. And there were many people in Massachusetts opposed to this war, specifically the newer English migrants who Wheelwright, Cotton, and Hutchinson were established with. With a growing political division and this large war with the native nation, the General Court of Massachusetts called for a day of fasting, January 19th, 1637, where people could atone, the colony as a whole could atone, for its collective sins, and then within the colony, there could be some reconciliation and harmony between the groups. And from the pulpit that day, John Cotton preached, just as the colony had suggested, a message of reconciliation. Wheelwright went hard into the other direction. Wheelwright urged those who believed in free grace to resist what he called the legalist party, living under a covenant of works, who were ultimately, in his view, antichrists. Now, to us, we would say, okay, that guy, that's that guy's view. But claiming somebody believes in a covenant of works and works alone is a denial of God's grace. 
calling someone the Antichrist or Antichrists collectively, you can imagine how uh, insulting that would be for the time. And in his speech, he also claimed that the Peacock War was itself a sign of the bad leadership of the colony, of the control the Antichrist had over the colony. And what he outlined in its fullest interpretation would be a internal spiritual civil war with the forces of evil. And the evil was every minister in the Massachusetts Bay Colony other than Cotton and himself. Again, where Cotton found agreement, Wheelwright underlined his disagreements. Now, one of the strongest supporters of Wheelwright in the colony was Sir Henry Vane, who himself was one of the more recent migrants to the colony, but quickly rose to become governor of the entire colony because of his high class. Today, we think of class as just being connected to how much money you make or your family makes. But back then in England, it was, it was actually connected to, you know, your family, your raising, your breeding. Vane's father was a parliamentarian. And even though he was 22 and just showed up in Massachusetts, he almost instantly became governor. And so the old order Puritans who founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they found this a little threatening. Again, with these groups of people coming in, suddenly the sturdy middle class that had founded the colony could be outdone simply by the upper class aristocracy showing up and assuming control of a colony they had no part in building. So Vane falls in with all the rest of them. And although he supported Cotton and Wheelwright and Hutchinson, he didn't quite have a majority of the general court under his control. And so in May of 1637, John Wheelwright is called to the court to answer for things he said in his sermon. In court, Wheelwright was shown a copy of his sermon, a copy he didn't write down, and he didn't know who wrote it down, and he doesn't remember anyone writing it down as he gave it. As such, when the court asked him to approve the copy, he did not. Wheelwright then demanded to know the identity of his accusers, to which he was told that his accuser is his own speech. Then the court, without receiving approval over the dictation of his sermon, grilled him over every little detail in the supposed copy, especially every reference to a covenant of works. Why this is important, again, is believing in a covenant of works alone would, in the Puritan mind, doom somebody to hell, hellfire. And in the context of the sermon, was dooming the entire colony to damnation. This sounds very religious, and it is, but it's also political, saying that there's something fundamentally wrong with the colony, the people in the colony, the decisions the colony makes, the native nations that the colony decides to go to war with. All of that is an error. It is very much political, and the charge that Wheelwright was being judged on was whether or not he committed sedition. Now, in this case, there is no jury in the traditional sense, a jury of your peers as we would know it today. The court case consisted of 58 people who would get a single vote over Wheelwright's fate. You had the governor, Vane, who's a fan of Wheelwright. You have 12 magistrates, 12 ministers, and 33 deputies. A simple majority to the affirmative would be enough to convict. Now, already, although the governor is your friend, he gets as much of a vote as anyone else. That's one for Wheelwright. But the 12 ministers, the group of people that Wheelwright specifically condemned, they, of course, were for the conviction of sedition. And slowly but surely, the 12 ministers won over a majority. And Wheelwright was convicted of sedition and contempt of civil authority. Governor Vane and his party were outraged but not shocked by the results, and they asked the court to record their dissenting view. They were denied that right. Shortly thereafter, there would be another colony-wide election day. Wheelwright, Hutchinson, Cotton, and Vane supporters were all in the general Boston area. The one place you could cast your vote in the whole colony, of course, used to be Boston. But for this election, they moved it to Newton, which today doesn't seem like a big deal. But back in the time of horses and canoes, it served as an impediment to a few of the Vane supporters. As such, this wouldn't be the only reason, but the election was a complete defeat for the new wave of immigrants, Vane and all of his followers, and the people of Boston, as the old order had reestablished itself under Governor John Winthrop, who once back in power pushed a law through the general court really fast 
that required any candidate to be governor to reside in Massachusetts for at least a year. A big slap in the face to vain. Furthermore, there had been general petitions before Wheelwright's conviction and afterwards that contained a list of people who supported Wheelwright and did not see his words as being a conviction of sedition. This would include many Cotton followers and Hutchinson's people. Now, under the new government, this list became a hit list. This became the list of people to investigate, to otherwise run out of government or the colony altogether. Which brings us right back to Wheelwright, whom already having the conviction of sedition was in a state of limbo because he had yet to be sentenced with the punishment for sedition, which at this time would be banishment from the colony. Despite this political sentencing, he was still allowed to preach at Mount Wollaston. And this will differ from other dissidents that come out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where his conviction, despite its religious overtones, was purely political. And in terms of doctrine, Wheelwright, again, was near the edge of what was the acceptable bubble of, of Massachusetts Puritan, but nonetheless was still within the fold. And so didn't lose his post, wouldn't be excommunicated. He still had his job. And the reason why he wasn't immediately sentenced is to give him some amount of time to cool his head, realize he didn't want to be banished, and to retract the statements of his fast day sermon. But we know Wheelwright already. He's not going to do that. He's too stubborn. He's too strong. He's too big. He's not going to admit he was wrong. And in fact, in these episodes that will be coming out on these dissidents coming out of Massachusetts, none of them are ever really going to admit that they're wrong about anything because they're convinced of their elect status, of their connection to God. And if you were certain that you had a high way to God, how could you possibly be wrong about anything? And one thing Wheelwright certainly wasn't wrong about was that he knew eventually he would be banished. Now, Hutchinson's followers, they were looking to relocate somewhere near the Providence Colony, which, of course, was founded by Roger Williams, a previous Massachusetts dissenter. But Wheelwright, again, he's still in the wider fold. He's not as extreme as Hutchinson or Williams. And so we won't see him going south. In the months after the conviction, Sir Henry Vane, his most, most powerful supporter, leaves the colony, returns to England. A quick rise and fall, but we will see him again. Finally, in November of 1637, he's called to the general court for his sentencing, where he is asked if he would leave the colony willingly. He refused, claiming that if he left the colony willingly, it would be an admission of guilt. The next day, he was officially banished. Wheelwright then asked to appeal the decision to a higher court back in England. That appeal was denied. And then he was given two weeks to sell his property and settle his affairs and leave the colony. By this time, Hutchinson and her followers were on the way out. Cotton had returned back to the favor of the established order, and those who had signed a petition supporting Wheelwright, they lost the right to vote, many had lost their guns, and like Wheelwright, some would be banished. Wheelwright looked to the north for some safe haven to be found. Specifically, he traveled to the remains of the New Hampshire colony, which had fallen apart in 1635, upon the death of Sir John Mason, the owner of the colony. Mason's widow didn't see any benefit in spending any more money on the colony and told the employees of Mason in the colony to shift for themselves, which they took as meaning stop trying to run any semblance of a government, seize as much of Mason's property as you can for yourself, and anarchy ensued. Wheelwright, having no other choice, in the middle of winter, scouted out the location of Exeter and spoke to the sachems of the area, who said that there would be good farmland here, it'd be a good source of timber, there's great salmon fishing, and they convinced Wheelwright that this would be the place to make his purchases. And so he bought from the Sagamore Weehanoawit, a large tract of area about 30 by 30 miles in size. That would be 900 square miles. Now, although the natives were satisfied with the purchase, English law did not acknowledge native purchase alone as a validation for you, an English man, owning the land. As it was, you would have to satisfy the English proprietor, who would be the Mason estate, and the natives before your ownership could be established. Now, Wheelwright and his community would have the native end of the bargain, but not the English end. 
and it is known that there were a few other English people living in the area, but none in the concentration and the amount that Wheelwright was about to bring to Exeter. And this is where you really feel the, the weight on Wheelwright's shoulders, because about half of the families who are going to end up in Exeter in 1638 are going to be Lincolnshire families. Now, in this era of Puritan migration, usually a minister decides to relocate and his faithful flock will follow. As such, if you remember the beginning of the episode, Wheelwright was a pastor in a town in Lincolnshire. And so many of these families had followed him to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a colony that had been around less than 10 years, quite a gamble. And then still having faith in Wheelwright, they are now going to relocate to a place in the wilderness, only on the invitation and permission of the natives, whom they barely know, without any English title whatsoever, to start a new colony completely from scratch. Can you imagine the pressure on Wheelwright to care for this flock? The guilt he must have felt to some degree to put his people through a transatlantic voyage, a new beginning, and now another new beginning, all within the span of two and a half, three years. As such, from his larger purchase, he doles out the land to all the various settlers. He gives himself 80 acres and eight and three-fourths acres of marshland. Not a very large farm, actually and certainly not a very large slice of a 900-square-mile plot. The first order of official business was to not make a government, but to establish a church, of which Reverend John Wheelwright would be the head of it. This church appears to have remained in communion with the churches in Massachusetts. Like many of the New England colonies we're going to learn about, the church was established before the government. And often it will be the church members who establish what the government will be and who will run it. And so you have a strange mixture of separation of church and state and yet theocracy, seeing how the government will be designed by church members, but often the clergy will be exempt from holding official office in the government. So again, you have a less than or different than modern view of separation of church and state. As this is occurring, the Massachusetts General Court lets it be known to the people living in the remains of New Hampshire that it was an unfriendly act towards Massachusetts to welcome Wheelwright. In the late spring of 1638, more settlers come from the Massachusetts colony, as the weather dictates, including his mother-in-law, Suzanne Hutchinson, and much of the Hutchinson family that didn't end up going south to Rhode Island. Looking to make even more trouble for Wheelwright, it's known that the same area of Exeter that was granted to the natives to Wheelwright, the Massachusetts authorities authorized some settlers of their own to settle. Fortunately for Wheelwright, these people would trickle in slowly over the next couple of years, which from about 1638 to 1643, the historian Edward Chase Jr. describes Exeter as an independent republic. And so you must ask yourself, how was this republic governed? Well, Exeter didn't keep records like the Plymouth Colony did. And so we have just the barest outline of what happened during these couple years that this republic existed. Now, we do know that 35 church members were the founding members of Exeter in the governmental sense and created a compact, which brings to mind probably for you the Mayflower Compact. English settlers had a tendency to assume the right of self-government if there was no established order. Uh, a tendency to do this over the French or the Spanish or the Portuguese, whom it never really occurred to them to do the same. For some reason, the English do this over and over and over again. And it'll become a reoccurring theme in our podcast because it's not just the English. The Americans do it too, where they will establish their own runaway republics whenever they see necessary. And again, it's something that other European immigrants to the New World don't tend to do. I don't exactly have the answer of why they do these things, but they do. And so in the spring of 1639, sorry for the digression, Wheelwright and the 35 church members they make a combination for self-government, what's known today as the Exeter Compact. There was much discussion, and it was finally signed, believe it or not, July 4th, 1639. The government would consist of three elders at the top, elder using a church term, not by coincidence. One of the elders would be titled a ruler, and he would be, of course, the chief among equals. These three would serve to be the executive and judicial branch, using terms that we would understand today. 
the legislative branch would be all of the freemen of the colony who were church members. There would be no voting of representatives to sit in your legislative body. Exeter was small enough that any of the freemen could just be part of the legislative body. As such, the legislative body makes laws, if you don't already know. Now, the ruler did have the power to veto any of these laws, although they did not call it a veto. And with that structure in place, that's how they govern the roughly 35 founding families of Exeter. Economically, it is known that Exeter remained a poor settlement, mostly based on subsistence, keeping themselves alive. The compact specifically bans the sale of firearms and gunpowder to the natives, which would keep the Massachusetts Bay Colony happy with them, and then also ban the sale of alcohol to the natives, which would keep a lot of the local Sagamores happy, as Native American leaders often complained about the sale of alcohol to their younger men. The aforementioned historian Edward Chase Jr., he claims that at maximum, the Exeter combination had governance over what is modern-day Exeter, Newmarket, Newfields, Brentwood, Epping, and Fremont. A decent chunk of land, and it is worth noting that other little locales in what would now be New Hampshire and into Maine, they also created their own compacts or combinations. Unfortunately, there's just even less information about those organizations than this one. But of course, if I've already used the word maximum, you know that this is the climax, the apex of what Exeter would become. As mentioned in a previous episode, in 1639, the Massachusetts Bay Colony begins to look for the source of the Merrimack River. Now, what's important here is that in their charter, it gives them domain over all of the area three miles north of the Merrimack River, which many people assumed at the outset would be where the Merrimack River feeds into the, to the Atlantic Ocean. But it doesn't actually specify that. So if they could find the source of the Merrimack, however far north it goes, they could, with some argument, claim three miles north of that point. Now, I don't know if you're a big river buff, but if you do that and you find the source of the Merrimack River and you carry that line of latitude to the east, it cuts into Maine today. And so even though Wheelwright took his banishment, left the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it seems that they were chasing him. It is known that in the very same year, 1639, someone or some group of people from Exeter petitioned Massachusetts for absorption by the Bay Colony, only to be quickly rescinded. Now, of course, Dover also applied to join Massachusetts. And from this date on, more and more towns in modern-day Maine and New Hampshire would do so as the proprietary governments start to fall apart and as the Civil War back in England leaves these little outposts without any sort of direction. That former direction would have come from Sir John Mason and his government in New Hampshire, which had long since disappeared. But in the 1640s, Mason's heirs would come to New Hampshire looking for their property, all the stuff their employees had stolen away from them. Suddenly, all the settlers in New Hampshire were again looking for some sort of direction or protection. Now, pledging allegiance to the Massachusetts Bay Colony would assure that John Mason's heirs wouldn't confiscate your fields and your farm, your house and your mill. In 1641, Strawberry Bank and Great Island are annexed by Massachusetts. The Creep North continues. In 1641, it is known that Exeter fell into two political factions, one in favor of joining Massachusetts. Believing Massachusetts propaganda, they believed they fell in the zone of Massachusetts anyway and would eventually be absorbed, and they may as well apply to be absorbed and obtain better terms than having been taken over by force. The other faction, firmly behind Wheelwright, realized, well, if Exeter is absorbed by Massachusetts, our reverend will have to again leave because he is banished from the colony of Massachusetts. By the end of the year, some of the members of the community of Exeter submit another petition to Massachusetts, this time containing some of the names of the people who actually signed the Exeter combination, some of Wheelwright's own fold, who now would rather be part of Massachusetts than have Wheelwright as their reverend. This must have been a huge sting at this point for a headstrong man such as Wheelwright. Seeing the writing on the wall, Wheelwright and his in-law, Sam Hutchinson, they began to look for yet another location further to the north, somewhere far away from Massachusetts. 
and they buy some property in Wells, Maine, part of the gorgeous government. And they began preparations to abandon Exeter and relocate. By 1642, Exeter was the only remaining town in New Hampshire that didn't fall into Massachusetts jurisdiction. The walls were crumbling in on Exeter and Wheelwright. The Massachusetts General Court in 1643 rejects the former 1641 petition from the people of Exeter. Massachusetts not feeling they would need to meet Exeter's demands to absorb it. And now Exeter created a final petition, removing most of their demands, except for the specific right to be a freeman and thus have some suffrage without regard to your religious membership. Massachusetts accepts this petition and in 1643 absorbs Exeter. That concession, though, gave this part of New Hampshire a rare amount of religious freedom that the rest of the Massachusetts Bay Colony would not have. And so a quaint but important legacy. In the five or so years of the Exeter Combination's existence as an independent republic, it parceled out land, it managed law and justice, it handled native relations, it regulated lumbering, it paid for supplies to run a militia, and it passed laws. It was certainly more legitimate than any New Hampshire government at the time, and thus worth an episode on this podcast. But let's turn to Wheelwright, who again had to flee to Wells, Maine. In May of 1643, Wheelwright was given a two-week pass to visit the colony of Massachusetts following a letter-writing campaign. In those two weeks, he visited many in the colony, made amends with various ministers that he had previously condemned to hell, and in 1644, the Massachusetts General Court actually lifts his banishment. By this time in English history, we're beginning a civil war, and Massachusetts, which had previously been threatened by the royalists and the king, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias and Sir John Mason, all of that is disappearing as parliamentary forces are winning, and they're actually confirming the legitimacy of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. No longer would one reverend, John Wheelwright, be able to threaten the mighty Massachusetts. Furthermore, with the ending of the Civil War, we see Wheelwright's friend, Oliver Cromwell, eventually establish his protectorate over England, Scotland, and Ireland. Wheelwright actually becomes quite an asset to the colony, and like many Puritans, moved back to England during this time. There he rekindles his friendship with Cromwell and with Sir Henry Vane, and through almost no attempt of his own, became one of the most well-connected reverends on the island. During the same period of time, a book was published on the antinomian controversy, the anti-law controversy that Wheelwright, Hutchinson, and Cotton were all wrapped up in that portrayed Wheelwright and his supporters as ultimately wrong in their free grace argument. And with the lifting of Wheelwright's banishment, it appeared to him that outsiders would see him as the prodigal son, as the one who returned, the one who sought forgiveness, the one who was in error and found his better way. But of course, that wasn't Wheelwright. He hadn't done anything wrong in his own eyes. His views were 100% correct. And in response, he published his own work. And in 16... 54 was actually able to get the Massachusetts General Court to vindicate and overturn their prior conviction, finding that he never practiced a religion in error. It pays to have powerful friends. And oddly enough, toward the end of his life, Wheelwright found his way back to Massachusetts, began working again as a minister, and died there in 1679. A strange ending for a dissident who condemned Massachusetts to hell made his own breakaway Republic of Exeter, find that falling apart, Massachusetts absorbing it, and him further having to escape to, to Wells, Maine, only to have his banishment lifted, and then by chance have his friends back home ascend to great power, only to die happily in the colony you accused of being run by the Antichrist. And with that, our story is over. Our next few episodes, we'll talk about those dissidents who went further off the grid and moved south to the borderlands between the Narragansett and the Wampanoag, forming very similar compacts and independent settlements that through the forces of history would be pushed together to form a colony that would become a state that you very well know today. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening to the Other States of America History Podcast. 